Um, so good to see you guys. My name is Daniel Kim, and uh, let me just introduce myself to you a little bit more um, since we're going to be spending the next three days together. Um, I was born in Korea, and in that sense, I'm fresh up the boat. Um, I was born in Korea. I lived in Korea until I was 10 years old, and uh, when I was 10, I'm, I um, moved to Japan, where my father, my father was born and raised. Um, my father, even till now, he still doesn't speak much Korean. He's, he's only biologically Korean, but everything else is pretty much Japanese. And uh, I lived in Japan for another 10 years, um, finishing on my elementary school and junior high and high school. Um, so pretty much 10 years in Korea, 10 years in Japan. While I, was in living, while I was living in Japan, I attended an international school in Japan in a place called Fukuoka, down in the south, southern part, just like, just like Atlanta. Um, as soon as I graduated from high school, I came to the U.S. That's another 10 years of my life. Um, that's the life in the U.S. Uh, while I was in the U.S., um, I attended uh, the Citadel, the military college of South Carolina. Uh, not too far from here, actually Atlanta is actually um, one of the places I used to come to visit to see Korean people. <laughs> you know, it's, there weren't many Koreans back then, back in Charleston. And as soon as I graduated, I moved up to Chicago um, to attend um, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. It's a seminary. It's, it's a four-year program. As soon as I graduated, I'm serving the church. I was ordained as a minister of Southern Baptist Church, and I was sent out as a missionary to travel around different places in the world to share the gospel. And that's how I've been living for the last six years. So you can pretty much calculate how, how old I am, right? Uh, 10 years in Korea, 10 years in Japan, 10 years in the U.S., and, and all that, right? So... Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight, and um, we're going to be spending uh, the next five sessions together. And uh, um, as we begin, I just wanted to uh, tell you, I, I was really blessed with the worship this, uh, tonight. It was just a powerful worship, and it really made me think about the glory that I once beheld when I was 13 years old, and that glory made all the difference in my life. Um, I'll probably talk about that tonight. But as we begin, I just wanted to remind you of what's going on outside in the world. Looking at those things that's going on in the world, um, I just wanted to remind you today that there's one thing that I really want to emphasize for the next five sessions, and that is this. Jesus is coming soon. There isn't really um, much time left for us. Um, it could be very soon, and I don't know exactly when that, that might be, but I know the time has drawn very close to us. So as we... Um, live the remaining time uh, at the time since the time is at hand um, i'm gonna talk about the five things over the last five sessions the five things that we must renew within ourselves in order to prepare his kingdom number one tonight we're going to talk about the glory the glory number two the journey number three the journey is tomorrow morning the tomorrow night the calling number four the song a new song and the number five the remaining time. So those are the five things that we're going to talk about for the next five sessions. And um, let's begin with the uh, first session, the glory. Um, like I, uh, before, as we begin this passage, I just wanted to ask four questions. That's, these are the four questions that's, that's gonna, uh, that we're going to examine tonight. These are the four questions. Number one, what is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of my life? And what am I living for? And for the remaining time, what am I going to live for? A very simple question. What is the purpose of my existence? Number two, when I, try, when I try to live for that purpose of my life, what are some of the consequences, some of, some of the prices that I have to pay? What is the price that I have to pay in order to achieve, the, achieve in, in order to accomplish the purpose of my life? Number three, um, what is the outcome of the, per, uh, of the price? What, what, what happens? What, what's the fruit of um, the price I should pay. Not, lastly, number four, how do I do this? These are the four, four questions that we're going to examine tonight, the glory. So let's dive in. Number one, what do I live for? What is the purpose of my life? You know, a lot of people say, you know, everybody's different. You know, you have no right to tell me what, what I'm living for, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, there are certain things in this world that are relative. But I'm going to tell you tonight, there are certain things that are absolute. 
And as far as the purpose of my life goes, it's not in the relativi relativistic session, uh, category, but the purpose of my life is something that is absolute. It, it doesn't vary from person to person, but there is one purpose that God has designed us for, that, that, I, that God has designed us for. Is this a good microphone or a bad microphone? It's a simple question. Is this a good, good microphone or a bad, mic bad microphone? Kind of good? Kind of good? Yeah, it's, it's a postmodern. Yeah, it's kind of good. Well, well, this room is pretty hot. Is this, this, is, this might be a bad microphone. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. If I take this microphone and um, you know beat up this little pulpit, and it doesn't break, and I say oh, this is a terrible microphone, does it make sense? It doesn't make sense, does it? Why? Because there is another question that you must answer way before you begin to think about whether this is good microphone or bad microphone. What is the question that you must ask? The question is, what is this microphone made for? When you answer that question, now you can begin to think about whether this is a good microphone or a bad microphone um, measured by the purpose what, what, why this is created. I'm going to ask you this question. Are you living a good life or a bad life? There's only one way to answer that question, too. How do you answer it? What am I made for? It doesn't matter how, how good looking you are. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing seven jeans or true religion. It doesn't matter what kind of college you go. Those things do not define how your life is. How your life is, determining whether you're living a good life or a bad life, that is determined by whether you're fulfilling the purpose of your life or not. Are you fulfilling the purpose of your life? Are you fulfilling the very purpose why you're created for? Only when you are able to answer that, you'll be able to begin to, you, you'll, you'll only be able to begin to answer the question, Maybe I'm living a good life. Maybe my life is not successful. So tonight, let me ask you this question. What am I made for? Why am I existing? Every breath that you're taking at this moment, why are you taking that breath? Why are you here tonight? What am I supposed to live for the rest of my life? The Bible tells us one word, the glory, the glory of God. The Bible says whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, I was, you know, I was 13 years old when I beheld that glory. I never knew that, you know, I never, had, I never expected that glimpse of God's glory would make all the difference in my life. You know, I was um, 13 years old. Is there any 13-year-olds here? Anyone? All right. I guess I was the only 13-year-old. Um, I, was, I was 13 years old. I went to the Philippines with a missionary. And this missionary is a, he's a very interesting guy. He's, um, he's a chiropractor. He wanted to do medical missions, so he took me along with him for 40 days over four different places. Hong Kong, Thailand, Bangkok, and then Bangladesh, Dhaka, and then to the Philippines, Manila, and everywhere else. Over those 40 days, um, he actually um, taught me what the glory of God is. And actually, he actually provided for me uh, an opportunity for me to behold the glory of God. So the first night, I, I, um, I arrived in Hong Kong. He came to greet me at the airport. He took me to you know, the place where I was staying. The first night, he told me, you know, it's pretty late to go to sleep, so I went to sleep. I probably slept for about five hours. About five hours later, he wakes me up out of nowhere. So I hear this voice while I was sleeping. So I hear this voice out of this darkness. I, I hear, wake up. And I would think, you know, God, are you calling me? You know, I sat up and I knelt down. And I said, God, here I am. And the missionary is standing in the corner. And he goes, it's me. <laughs> and it's like, take your Bible and come over here. So I took my Bible and I sat there, you know, right in face, facing him. You know, I was born in the fourth generation Christian family. I've always been attending the church, but I never really understood how much, who, who God really is and what I was living for. But that morning... He says something to me that changed my life. I, because of that moment of my life, I am here before you. He said to me that morning, I'm going to tell you a verse that will transform your life. This is the reason why you're breathing. This is the reason why you're living. This is the reason why you should be dying for. And I was just like eager to hear that, you know, eager to hear, hear, hear that verse. He, goes, he tells me that verse is, he goes, open 1 Corinthians 10.31. So I opened with this eagerness, I opened, and this is what the verse says. 
Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all the glory of God. The very reason why we're created is for the glory of God. The reason why we're breathing and walking around, going to school, going to church, saying that we, we serve the Lord, every single thing that we do, we're doing it for the glory of God. That's the first time that I start to really ask the question, what does the glory of God mean? What does it mean? That's probably one of the most common words that you use in the church, right? We, t- we sang about the glory of God. We, we pray that let your glory come down, but what does it mean to glorify God? What does it mean by the glory of God? What does it mean? So tonight, I'm going to talk about that. You know, the, the, the original word, glory, is actually from the Greek term, Greek terminology called doxa. Doxa. That's where the word doxology came from. Doxa. And in the Hebrew word, in the Old Testament, glory, the word glory um, is, um, is a word kabod. So in kabod and doxa, the, the meaning that's actually contained in, that, in, in those two words are a little different from the, from the way how you know, we would use the word glory. When we, saw, when we say, I want to glorify you, God, let your glory come down, what does that usually mean? What does that usually mean? It means usually, I praise you, and I want to, you know, lift you up high, you know, let your glory come. I don't know what it is, but just come anyways. <laughs> right? That's what it usually means. But in the word doxa, or kabod, it usually means something that's more tangible. You know what that is? There are four elements to the word glory. Let's, let's examine that. In the original word, in the original word, glory, kabod, or doxa, there are four elements that make up the word. Number one, please repeat after me, matter. 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 That's, the, that's the first element of the word glory. What is the matter? For many, many years, people had this ideal. People had this hope. Maybe one day, there will be a God who can love me for who I am. Maybe out there somewhere, there is a God that can love me as a, as a father, you know, who, who, who can embrace me, who can forgive my sins, who can fight for me. Maybe there is a God out there who's going to be able to die for me. You know, but one day, that ideal, that hope, actually became flesh, became the actual matter, and came to this earth. You know what that is? The person of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says, in the face of Jesus Christ, we, help, we beheld his glory. What does that mean to you tonight? It means, unless God becomes the actual matter in your life, you will not be able to live a life that glorifies God. You know, who is God to you tonight? Who is God? Your father's father? Is someone that appears in your pastor's sermon? Is someone that you just worship at the church? Who is God? Who is God to you tonight? Is it just someone that we somehow vaguely, you know, think about? Is, is it, some, is, is it some, some abstract figure that we just want to worship because we want to worship something? Who is God to you? Unless that God becomes an actual matter in your life, you won't be able to take your life online and say, you know what, God, since I know that you're a real God, I'm, I'm willing to risk my life for you. That time came when I was 13 years old. And this missionary guy is pretty, pretty interesting. He tells me that morning, when I was 13 years old, he says, you know, memorize this verse. I memorized it. And I was like, therefore, whether you are drinking, I memorized it. He goes, okay, good. Now you memorize in Korean. So I opened my Korean Bible, and I had to memorize in Korean. I memorized it. He goes, you know what, let's worship together. I was like, okay. So we worship together at 5 a.m. in the morning. I'm just like worshiping at 5 a.m. in the morning. It's just, it's just two of us. But he even gave me the benediction, right? The full benediction, the entire worship. At five, I said, aren't you going to take up the offering? He was like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to give you the benediction, right? So I just sat there, and I worshiped with him, and he, and he taught me how to do quiet time. So after the whole memorization of the verses, he, he actually um, got, you know, led me into worship, and now he's, he wants to teach me how to do quiet time. I never knew what quiet time was until, now, until then. And then he walked me through how to do quiet time, and I looked at the watch. It was already 7 o'clock. He goes, no, let's go eat breakfast. So we went to eat breakfast, and it was Chinese dim sum. Does anyone know what dim sum is? It's pretty interesting, you know. But, you know, think about it. It was like 20 some years ago, 25, 20 like some years ago. I went to Hong Kong. I went to the Chinese dim sum place. It's pretty loud when just a bunch of Chinese people get together in the morning. It's like I'm just sitting down there. I'm like, goodness, like what is this place? 
you know, dim sum is like, you know, just small Chinese delicacies, you know, the people put it on the card, they walk around, you have to choose what you want to eat. So this missionary goes, you know what, choose whatever you want. I was looking at it and everything looks pretty gross. <laughs> it's like, what, what part of the meat is that? Like, <laughs> I'm looking at it, it's like, define that, explain that. Just sitting there, but I have actually found, you know, a dish that I thought it was edible. So I thought, you know what, I want that. So I brought it, opened it. I thought it was like, you know, teriyaki chicken on top of the rice. It sounds pretty good, right? So I opened it, steam came out, <sighs> I cleared up the air, and I saw the actual thing. It was the chicken feet. There are three pieces of chicken feet on top of the rice. And I'm, I'm, like, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking in my head, am I supposed to eat this? So I looked at the missionary, and the, this missionary already knows exactly what I'm thinking. You know, he tells me, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, I ate that. You know, going with a missionary, there is nothing that I didn't eat, prob probably. Especially, I, I remember one instance where I was in the Philippines. I, I um, you know, for those of you who have, you know, anybody have ever been to the Philippines? Next time, you, if, you, like, if you ever go there, um, get this thing called balut. You know what that is? How long does it take? How many days does it take for, a, for, for an egg to hatch? 21 days. But I don't know why people do this kind of stuff. And they were like, ha let's, ha, let's try this, you know. Let, you know. It's take, the, take, the, take this egg and let it wait for about 10 days until the little chick is formed inside, and then you boil it. I went to this like Filipino like native town, and I went there, and this like bunch of native na natives came over, came over with a basket full of eggs, and I thought it was Easter egg. I was like, oh my goodness! I took the egg, like, you know, I try to like peel it off. So I did that. I peeled it off, and I saw this little eyeball looking at me. <laughs> You know, I made an eye contact right there. <laughs> I was thinking, what is in there? <laughs> Very interesting. So I peeled it off. Guess what? There's a little chick sitting in there. So there is still nothing that I don't eat. I fixed that when I was 13 years old. And after we eat, he, he, the missionary tells me, let's go out to the mission field. We go, we go, we go travel through different, different parts of the Philippines, uh, different parts of uh, Hong Kong, and we go, out, we go throughout the mission field. We come back at night. At 11 p.m., he takes off all his clothes, and he gives, it to me. He, he gives it to me. He goes, go wash. He goes to sleep, right? At 11 p.m., 13-year-old me, I take all his clothes, dirty clothes, dirty laundry. I go down the first floor with a little, you know, what is it, wash, washboard, washing board? You, you squat down, you start washing his clothes. I, was, I would get really angry at times because I thought it was like child labor law violation. <laughs> <laughs> you would hang the clothes and you go to sleep. You don't really sleep because he's a chiropractor. You know, chiropractors, they really value your posture, even the way you sleep, you know? So he wouldn't place me in a bed where I can roll around and sleep in the wrong posture, but he would put me on a, on a church pew. So I would stand in the position of attention the entire night. And guess what happened? After about 30 days into the vision trip, into the mission trip, I actually got sick because my body couldn't take it anymore. When I got sick, my uh, fever was going over 100 degrees. The missionary told me, you know what, stay here. And he left me alone. So I was in the Philippines, a little small house, by myself. I was thinking, am I going to die like this? When I was in such utter desperation, I cried out to God, God, there's no one around me. Am I going to die, like, am I, am I die like this? You know, I've always known about you. I've always known my parents are firm believers of you. But I've always gone to church. I knew you were somewhere out there, but you were never my God. But if you're really out there, come to me and tell me that you love me. I started crying out, cry out to God out of, this, out of this desperation. But that day, God decided to come and reveal himself to me. I think God reveals himself to, you know, to everybody in a different way. But on that day, he revealed himself to me in such a way that I had this um, indescribable uh, assurance that God loves me. That's the way that God, had, God came into my heart. That's the day that I knew God is really out there 
And he, he, he's not just a God out there, but he, he's a God for me. And I remember, uh, I remember till this day, I, was, um, I, I felt as if my heart was about to burst. So I started to cr- scream out and cry out, and I started rolling the floor. Um, I think I cried about for three hours, rolling on the floor, w- filled, filled with the love of God in my heart. On that day, as I was rising up from the floor, I still remember the confession that I made to God. God, if you're so, because you're so real in my life, I'm willing to risk my life for you. So tonight, brothers and sisters, I'm going to challenge you. Who is God to you? Is God some God out there, or an abstract figure, or someone you can rely on, but you don't know who he is? But I'm going to ask you tonight, as the days are drawing closer to us, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to, ask you to pray, God, I want you to really come into my life. I want you to be real in my life. I want you to be a real matter in my life, that I'm going to be willing to risk my entire life on you. Are you willing to do that? Amen. Number two, number two, second element. Please repeat after me. Wait. Um, you know, because there's a matter, there's a weight. You know, every matter actually has a weight. So when you say, um, does it matter to you? What does that mean? How much does it weigh in your life? Isn't that, isn't that what it means, right? So when, when God starts to weigh so much in your life, nothing else begins to matter in your life because he is the matter of your life. You know, when, God, when, when we talk about things like this, many times we have this false picture of God, you know, saying maybe God is so demanding. Maybe he's so egocentric. Maybe God is so selfish that he wants, he wants everything from us. But you know what I'm going to tell you tonight? God created, for his, God created us for his glory, which means we are the happiest when we're actually living for his glory. God created us to be satisfied with him alone because God knows that's the only way that our life will be unshakable. Amen. And I remember to this day, you know, I actually did six years of um, EM pastor back in Chicago. I was attending a Korean church and how Korean churches are. And I was, you know, looking after this um, junior high students, high school students, and the college students. And this guy, one guy, this one guy that I know, I've um, been his youth pastor since he was in seventh grade. And he finally entered, he finally graduated from high school. And then when he graduated from high school, he entered, this is a very good uni- university called um, Northwestern University. Does anyone know Northwestern? It's a very good school, right? He actually entered, uh, he, was at, he actually um, made it into the medical program there. Smart guy, sharp guy. And, you know, the entire church, you know how Korean churches are. Korean church, everybody's excited. Oh, my gosh, he's successful. You know, he's going to be such a successful guy. You know, oh, Jamie so much good. Like, like, like so excited. Like, like, everybody's, like, so happy about him, you know. I, as a pastor, I was so proud of him, too. I, I was thinking, you know what, this guy, his life's set. I don't have to ever worry about him. He's, he's, he's good at taking care of himself. You know, he entered. He started his first year at, at, at Northwestern. Um, I think it was September 1st. And it's been about two months since he entered. And um, on October 31st, right after the Halloween party, I received a phone call at 1 a.m. in the morning. I still remember uh, I was sleeping. Right? And uh, at 1 a.m., my phone rings. I pick up the phone. I say, Hello? And it wasn't him, but it was his girlfriend that he was dating at that moment. And I was like, hello? And his girlfriend is like screaming at me. He's like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? Like, what's going on? And his girlfriend goes, you know what? My friend, my, my boyfriend, James, he jumped into Lake Michigan because she had told him just that day, you know, we're, we're, we're probably not getting along together, so let's break up. Let's not see each other anymore. Farewell. So he was shocked by that. So he was so shocked, he actually decided to uh, commit, uh, commit uh, suicide. So he jumped into Lake Michigan at 1 a.m. in the morning, right next to Northwestern campus. You know, those of you that have been to um, Chicago, you, you guys probably know how that is. In the wintertime, it gets extremely cold. When I talk about cold, it, I mean really cold. And you know how Lake Michigan is. It's not like you know, a small pond you know, you, where you fish. It's, it's a big lake, you know? At 1 a.m. in the morning, just because his girlfriend told him that let's break up, he was so shocked he jumped into the lake to kill himself. So I told the girl, hold on, I'm going to be right there. I hung up the phone. As I was hanging up, I was putting my jacket on. As soon as I got in the car, I put my, ga- like, put my feet on my gas. I was just, you know, racing down the highway, right? 
I was probably going about 30 miles per hour, like th not 30 miles per hour, 30 miles over the speed limit. 30 miles per hour. <laughs> it's like, like whether he dies or not, it's not my problem. Not 30 miles per hour. You don't drive into small streets 30 miles per hour. <laughs> Improvise. So I was going about 30 miles over the speed limit down the highway. You know, so I was like putting, you know, stepping my gas, like. I was beating up, beating up my car. I said, go, why don't you go faster? My car was a Jeep Wrangler. He doesn't go fast. Go, hurry up, hurry up. I was beating, my, beating up my car. And what happens if you go 30 miles over a speed limit? Woo! I got pulled over. The officer came with a gun. At 1.30 a.m. in the morning, he knocked on my window. He's just waiting. You know? I rolled out my window, and he's like, why are you, why are you speeding so much? Hey, I said to him, Sir, I have to go. My student just jumped into the Lake Michigan. He's going to commit suicide. I have to go rescue him. This police officer, he goes, oh, really? Follow me. <laughs> I was chasing the police officer right behind his squad car. You know, the police cars, they're turbocharged. They have this it's a NOS. <laughs> they probably go 100 miles per hour. I can't chase him. Sir, can you slow down? <laughs> It usually takes about 45 minutes, but it took me only 15 minutes to get down to the campus. So when I actually arrived at the campus, my hands were shaking. I couldn't get out of the car. I actually prayed to God. I said, God, you know, bring me a miracle. Somehow rescue him. Do, somehow do something, you know. This guy, this guy, he shouldn't die for this. Come on, God. Can somehow bring in the, the fish, that big fish that you have sent to Jonah and rescue him somehow. I prayed, you know. I got out of the car. I ran to the lake. Guess what happened? This guy was actually right next to the lake on the rock with a blanket over him. So I said, hallelujah. I went to him, I woke him up. I said, what happened? Who rescued you? How did you get out? And I still remember to this day what this guy said to me that day. He was waking up. He, he looked at me and said, who rescued you? Who rescued you? What happened? What happened? How'd you get out of there? And this, this is what he said. He said, oh, it was so cold. I got to get out. What do you do with, the kind of, with these kind of people? You know, there's a police officer waiting, waiting for like, I'm like, get back in there. No, you don't do that. That day, something struck me really hard. His problem is not his girlfriend. His problem was himself. It was his own weakness that cannot handle, that cannot handle the difficult obstacles of his life. You know, he had this, his entire weight resting on his girlfriend. When his girlfriend crumbles down, there's nothing to support his life anymore. You know, when you go to school and people talk trash to you, all this racism and all that stuff, and you're so angered by that, that's your childhood anger that's been building up, and you take a, you know, a bunch of, you, you take a machine gun and you shoot, shoot everybody in the school, whose fault is that? People's fault? Society's fault? No, it's not. It, it is your fault. It's ultimately your fault that that cannot handle the difficulties of your life. You know, your, your desire for affirmation, your confirmation, people's compliments were resting upon what people are thinking. Your desire for acceptance were completely resting upon how people are thinking. When those people do not accept you, that's when your life falls apart. But I'm going to tell you tonight, there's one thing that doesn't change yesterday, today. Thank you, beautiful wife. That's what he says. There's one thing that doesn't ever change. You know what that is? The love of God, the existence of God, the purpose of our life, the glory of God. You know, why, you know, you know what the Bible says about that? For I am persuaded persuaded that neither death nor life, nor height, nor depth, nor height, nor depth, nor things present or nor things to come, nor, nor anything else in this all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, even if your parents, even, your, even if your mother leaves you, I'll never leave you. Behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. And if your life, your, if, if your entire life is resting upon that, guess what? Your girlfriend says, I don't like you. And if, even if she leaves, it's tough, but it's okay. You can go through that. 
If your life is resting upon the unshakable love of God, the glory of God, guess what? If you don't get into the college, if you get into a car accident, you don't get the dream job that you're working towards, guess what? Even if you don't get any of those, since your life is not resting upon it, you will still be okay. That's what it, mean, that's what it means to glorify God. The weight you're giving God, the entire weight of your life. He becomes the gravity of your life who sustains you. Does God make you cry? Does God make you happy? Does God make you feel affirmed? Does God make you uh, feel like I can go on in the midst of this sorrow? That means God has become the weight of your life. Number three, number three, please repeat after me, beauty. beauty. That's the third definition of the word glory. That's the reason why you're living for. It is to find them beautiful. You know, the Bible, the scripture tells us tonight, there are some Greeks that actually went to, uh, went up to Jerusalem um, to, to worship during the time of the feast. You know, when, I, when they up, they actually probably heard about Jesus. They came to Jesus' disciples and asked him, Sir, um, we're actually here to meet Jesus. Can you um, somehow take us to Jesus? And this is what the Jesus, uh, Jesus' disciples said. Sir, please hold on. I'm going to go ask him. Jesus, those guys over there, they, wanna, they came to see you. If you were Jesus, what would you, tell, what, what, what would you, what would you say? Well, not time yet. Tell them to come back later. Or, yeah, send them in. Or, what would you say? What did Jesus say? Let's look at verses 20 to 23. Let me read this, all right? Verses 20 to 23, I'll read this. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for me. The hour, the hour has come for the Son of, Son of Man to be glorified. What? Does it make sense? Jesus, those guys want, came to see you. Should I send them in or should I tell them to come back later? Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What does that mean? Does it make any sense to you? But this is what he meant. It was a perfect answer because he was saying this. Those guys that are claiming to, came, claiming, um, to meet, uh, claiming that they want to meet Jesus, they didn't really come to see me. Those, those guys probably heard about me, about feeding the 5,000 with, two loaves, uh, two, with the five, five loaves of bread and two fish. Those guys probably heard about Jesus, who made the dead men come, come back alive, and they want that kind of miracles in their life, fix their problems of their lives. That's why they came to see me. But because of me, for my sake, if they have to go through the persecution, they'll just leave with one breath. But that's not the type of Jesus I want, to, I want to show you. The type of Jesus I want to reveal to you is the Jesus that is crucified. And that is a Jesus lifted up high. The glory of God revealed to you. Why? Why cross? Jesus Christ was pointing towards cross and saying, you know what? By me being crucified on the cross, I will reveal the true beauty of God to you. And at that moment, when you behold that beauty, the, the glory of God, until now, you use Jesus to get wealthy. You use Jesus to fix your problems with your life. Until now, you use Jesus to get into college, to make friends and get affirmation and feel good about yourself. But when you really behold the glory of God, from that moment, you don't use God. From that moment, what happens? He is the end in itself. He, you say, you know what? Until now, I use Jesus as a means to something, get something else. But from now on, since Jesus Christ has become the end in itself, I'll do anything to have him and him alone. And why cross? Why cross of Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, the Jesus Christ cross reveals the true beauty of God. Think about it. It shows the mighty love of God. That he actually had to kill his own son to tell us how much he loves us. It shows the justice of God. That God is so just, he was willing to kill his son to display the justice. It shows the almightiness of God. He was willing to take Jesus Christ and crucify him on the cross as he promised to the world through many prophecies. 
He shows the faithfulness of God, the promise that he has made to Adam, Abraham, and then throughout the generations, and he finally accomplished, accomplished that promise through the, Jesus, through, through the Jesus Christ cross. It shows the wisdom of God. He made the worst situation into the greatest salvation. So when you look at, when you behold the cross of Jesus Christ, entire problem, every single problem in your life becomes no longer a problem in your life. When you are mesmerized, when you are lost in the beauty of God, you begin to lose yourself in the presence of God. You know, you don't believe me, do you? But I'm going to tell you a story. I actually have a friend who actually called me up at 1 a.m. in the morning. I don't know why people call me at 1 a.m. in the morning. Boop, okay, I'm going to call him tonight. <laughs> Don't call me at 1 a.m. in the morning. I don't. There is a friend, a good friend of mine. He actually called me at 1 a.m. in the morning. I was sleeping, you know, obviously, in Chicago. I was in bed, and he called me. Hey, I was like, oh, what's going on? My friend goes, I got to see you. I was like, no, 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 no. He goes, I'm right outside your house. Okay, bye. I hung up. I went out. He was waiting for me with the car. You know, it was winter time. It was probably below probably 10 degrees, minus 20 degrees or something. And he took me to Denny's. He took me to Denny's at 1.30 a.m. in the morning. You know, I get angered by that. I was just sitting there. I was so cold. And he's like, drink this. And I was drinking coffee. And I asked him, so what's going on? Tell me, what's the problem? And my friend goes, come on, what's the problem? He goes, why did you call me? Come on, tell me the problem. And he goes, <sighs> I, was, I was like, I'm going to strangle you. And he goes, no, 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 it's a serious problem. I was like, tell me what's the problem, what the problem is. And he looks around, he goes, I'm in love. <laughs> I literally, I wanted to, like, I'm leaving. And he goes, no, 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 don't go. I was like, why? He goes, my problem is a little more serious. I was like, what's the problem? And he goes, he looks around, he makes sure nobody's listening. He, he turns around, he tells me, I have an addiction. At that moment, I knew the problem was getting serious. I was like, what's the problem? What, what kind of addiction? I was thinking he was, saying, he's, he was going to say, oh, I'm an alcoholic or um, I'm some, some drug addict. But it was actually a little more serious. He actually said, I'm addicted to pornography. And I thought, what? And he goes, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm addicted to pornography, to internet pornography. And I was thinking, my goodness. And I asked him. So the best thing I could get, the best line I could ever come up with was, was this. So did you go to church? <laughs> and my friend goes, yeah. I was like, what did the pastor say? This is what he says. He's like, the pastor told me. I asked him, sincere, it's a sincere question. I was like, what did the pastor say? What, did, he, did, he, did, he, did he give you, give you the answer? How, what, what not to do? You know, what, what did the pastor say? This is what my friend said. He said, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him. So does it work? <laughs> and my friend told me, no, of course it doesn't work. And what are you supposed to say? I don't know, man, brother. I'm, I'm going to pray for you. That's exactly like that's what most Christian brothers do. Right? I'm going to pray for you. So I prayed for him. He went home all depressed, right? He told me later he didn't sleep the entire night because there was no answer to his addiction. What are the addictions? What are the problems? What are the troubles that you have in your life today? And how are you trying to fix that? What have you tried? Are you just trying? I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do. Does that fix it? Probably not. My, my friend, he, he, he stayed up the entire night. He actually went to see the professor that both my friend and I both respect very much. He knocked on the door. He opened the door. He walked in. And the professor goes, oh, yeah, how may I help you? My friend tells, me, tells him the entire problem, his entire situation. This is my problem. I'm addicted to this. And he's like telling him all these things. I'm in love. What am I supposed to do? How, uh, how could a person like me, a dirty person as I am, the filthy person as I am, supposed to love a girl like that, as supposed to ask that beautiful girl, a pure girl, a holy girl into marriage and say, would you marry me? How am I supposed to say that? Sir, what am I supposed to do? The professor listened to that, and he, this is what the professor says. Well, don't try not to do it. He goes, what? The professor says this. More you try, I'm not going to do I'm not going to see, I'm not going to do More you try to do that, you're already bound by that. Your entire thoughts and your entire life, your entire weight of your life rests on that. If you keep on thinking about it, you will always do it. You, won't, you, won't, you will never be able to escape from it. You know what? Let me tell you a little secret. If you really, really try hard, and if you actually are successful not doing it, 
there comes two more problems. You know what that is? The side effects. You know what that is? Number one, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to, I'm going to quit it. I'm going to really try hard. I'm going to be really good. Guess what happens? Number one, first problem, first side effect. You begin to bargain with God. God, I lived a good life. Now bless me. This is what I've done. I deserve her. Give it to me. And guess what? If persecutions come, if suffering comes in your life, if some hardships come in your life, guess what happens? I've done this much and you give me this? Goodbye. So be it. You, you leave the church. Is that what happens? Number two, I'm going to try really good and I'm going to really quit it. I mean, I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to drink it. I'm going to live a good life. Second problem comes. You know what that is? You begin to criticize others. Why are you doing it? I quit it. Why are you still doing it? I've, 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 I've quit it. You begin to measure yourself according to other people's standards. You know what? This is the limitations of the law. This is the side effects of the religion. But I'm going to tell you today what the gospel is. The professor goes, but brother, I'm going to tell you a little solution. My, my friend goes, sir, tell me. Out of desperation, the professor tells him, I'm going to tell you how, how, how to quit that. Sir, can you tell me that? And my, the professor says, just love the woman that you want to love with everything you've got, with all your heart, with all your mind. Everything you've got, just love her. And my friend goes, what? The professor tries to explain to him, you don't know how to love her? I'm going to tell you. If you, want, if you think of her, if you ever think about her, write her a letter. When you, whenever you think about her, write her a song and you go play for her. <laughs> Not him, but her. <laughs> she becomes a he. No. Whatever you think about her, you save up money and bring her chocolate or gifts or whatnot, flowers. You know, whenever you think about her, you go hide behind the bush whenever she's getting off the work and you go surprise and you take her back home. You know, just, just, just love her with everything you've got. Just be free to love her. And my friend goes, I think I can do that. He goes, go. Is that it? So he left. Guess what? A year later, I, I ran into him. I said, I said to my friend, so what, what happened? My friend goes, what? I asked him, so is that the fix to her? Or he's still struggling. My friend goes, what? My, oh my goodness, the Denny's talk that we had? And my friend goes, oh my gosh, it's gone. And I asked him, how? You know what he said? I was busy loving her. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. Jesus never said, don't do that, don't do this, do this, don't do that. Jesus never said that. Because even if you're successful in not doing it, there are many, many side effects. That's, not, that's the law. But what did, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, look at me. This is the Lamb of God that is crucified for you. The wisdom of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the mercifulness of God, the loving kindness of God, displayed on the cross. When you look at that, you will be busy loving him and him alone. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed by his awesomeness. You're going to chase. You're going to pursue after his glory. You're going to be busy pursuing after your glory entire life. And you don't even realize all the problems and sins and addictions in your life are evaporating. You don't even realize it. You don't realize it. Just, just, don't worry. This is the sound of evaporation just in case. You don't realize it's evaporating, but you're just too busy pursuing after his goodness. You're pursuing after him. And then one time in your life, you pause and you, you, you look back. Only then you'll realize, oh my goodness, I've changed. That's the song that we sang. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look, what is it? Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, to gaze upon his glory, to gaze upon his beauty, all the days of your life is the purpose of your life. Number four, please repeat after me, proclamation. So what's the first one? Matter. Number two, weight. Number three, beauty. Number four, proclamation. In the proclamation is this. Somebody gives me a good gift. You know, I know the Chris, Christmas has already passed, but I already, you know, I'm going to tell you tonight, I, I do accept the late gifts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
or next year too. Like I, I, iPad 3 is coming out. Anyways, <laughs> no worries. But um, let's say somebody, let's just say somebody gives me a good gift and I open that up and I unwrap it and I see this gift inside of it. And I see this gift and I'm, what do I do? If it's a beautiful gift, the most awesome gift, something that I really wanted, incomparable gift, what do I do? Without even, without somebody forcing me or twisting my arms, what do I do? I say, whoa, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, look at this, look at this, hey, hey, look at this. Oh my gosh, this is beautiful, oh my gosh. What is this? Proclamation. When you, when God becomes the real matter of your life, he becomes real God of your life, and you begin to gaze upon his beauty, the glory of God, and you're busy pursuing after his glory, you, you rest your entire life, wait on it, and guess what? Without you realizing yourself doing this, you're going to start proclaiming His glory. What is this? Your praise, your worship to Him, your evangelism, and that goes all the way out to the mission field. That is the purpose of your life. That's the one that determines whether you're successful or not successful in your, in your life. One time I went to this um, church called uh, Podowon Church in Korea. I was, I was preaching there, and I actually preached out of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1031 about the, about the glory of God. And after I preached that night, we were all praying, young adults like this, we were all praying in the little room. I said, let's pray together. I'm going to live for the glory of God. If that's the one, if that's, the one that's going to determine whether our life is successful or not successful, not successful I'm, you know, I'm going to live for this glory. Of, you know, we're going to pray like this. And I was like, Chris, you know, screaming out at me. Gia, Lord, and we're praying really hard, right? We're so busy praying and praying with the microphone in my hand. I was praying, and I, heard, I felt this wet hand out of nowhere held my hand. I opened my eyes. I looked around. Nobody was there. I looked down. There was a brother, a good-looking, handsome brother on a wheelchair, in a wheelchair, sitting there. He was crying. He was like, mm -hmm. his mucus and his everything. <laughs> it's a slide on and everything. He was, his tears. He held my hand with that. And I looked at him, it's like, sir, how may I help you? Please don't touch me with that hand. Anyways, he looked at me. You know what he said that to he, you know what he said to me on that day? This is what he said. He said to me, if that's the purpose of my life, even a person as I am can actually fulfill the purpose of my life. You know, if God's purpose of the of our lives is to go to good college, some of you have already failed. If the purpose God has given you for your life is to be successful in the worldly sense, some of you have already failed. And I would say God is an unfair God because some people have better chance of succeeding than others. But God is a very fair. No matter who you are, whether you're in a wheelchair or whether you're healthy, whether you're successful or unsuccessful in this world, God's standard is very clear. He's equal for everybody. God says, if you want to be successful, if you want to have a meaning of your life, if you want to, if you want to accomplish the purpose of your life, this is what you do. You have him as your personal Lord and Savior into your heart. As a matter of your life, as a real God of your life, the real salvation of your life, the real helper of your life. And then you gaze upon his beauty and you rest your entire gravity of your life upon him. And you pursue after him. Nobody has any excuse why he cannot do this. Do you have any better excuse? Oh, I can't do that because I, I can't see. Tonight, I'm going to ask you, brothers and sisters, to pray with me that God's going to display his beauty, that you will forever be changed. Amen. The time has come, but we still have to cover three more questions. But because of the time's sake, I'm going to actually... Um, breeze through the three questions, because these are the three questions that's going to probably come up over and over for the next uh, five, five days, all right? Number two, question number two. So when I, live for the, uh, when I live for the glory, the purpose of my life, what are some of the things that I should expect, the price that I have to pay? What is the price of uh, my life? I hate eating before preaching because belching comes up. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's, it's a teppanyaki. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, what is the price that I have to pay in order to live for the purpose of my life? Number uh, Verse 24, let's read this together. That tells us the answer of what kind of price that God is requiring for us to pay. Number, uh, verse 24, ready? Go. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. 
But if he dies, he bears much fruit. Amen. You know, um, as a little kid, I've always um, wanted to be a preacher. You know, some people ask me, so when did you want to be a preacher? When did you know that you want to do, like, missionary or pastor thing? You know, I'm, you, you really, do you want me to tell you the actual, like, honest answer? When I was four. Like, that's the only reason I, you know, I was thinking, you know, I, there's, that's the only reason why I can live another day. I want to be a pastor when I grow up. When I was four years old, without even knowing what that is. But, you know, what, what do kids do these days? You know, like kids, they play computer games, the internet games, you know, all that stuff. But when I was a little kid, like I pretty much spent most of my time in the church. I wake up, I go to church. You know, my family time, twice a day, we worship, family worship, morning and night. So for me, like heaven is not somewhere that I wanted to go when I was a little kid. Because I would ask my Sunday, t- Sunday school teachers, like, uh, miss such and such, like, what do, what pe- what do people do? Like when, you, when they go to heaven, into eternity, and my Sunday school teacher goes, we worship God. I'm like, no! I worship him all already at home, like every single day. But I, I mean, I pretty much grew up in the church. So as a kid, my favorite game, my, my favorite thing to do is, with my sister is to play the pastor and the congregation game. <laughs> Yeah. Unlike the you know normal kids, that's what we we would do. So my uh, my sister is praying every day inside her like little room. I would put a little gown over myself with a curtain, and I open the door and I walk in like this. And people, are, you know, you know what this is? It is gathering the Holy Spirit's power. I walk in like this. And my sister is praying really hard, and I said to her, "Sister, well, we're like, what's?" Uh, What's the illness that you have? You know, my, sis- my sister goes, you know, her, her illness changes every day. And she goes, I can't see, or I can't, my stomach hurts, or I'm possessed, or something like that. <laughs> I would ask her, um, do you want to be healed? And this is what my sister says. Sometimes my sister can't see, so I would, <laughs> I would spit on her, I would put on it. It's like, ooh, it's like, shut up. <laughs> you will be healed. <laughs> Don't do that at home. Your mother's going to put soap in your mouth if you do that. <laughs> Don't ever do that. But one time, you know, most of the time, I would actually um, put my, lay my hand on, on her head. I would pray for her. It's like, you know, if, God, would you come and heal her? Let the evil spirit, you know, I cast you out of you. I would pray. And when she's prayed for, she actually later opens her eyes and she's, she goes, I can see. <laughs> and I, I healed many diseases all my life. And, you know, but you know, when you're when you grow up like that, you pretty much grow. You go to church and you listen to many sermons, and most of the sermons that were popular back in the day was was this: If you believe Jesus Christ, there's no sufferings. If you believe Jesus Christ, there's no persecution. If you believe Jesus Christ really, really hard, everything's gonna work out for you. Back then, I really believed so. I said, "Oh, amen, amen to that." You know, if you do positive talking, everything's gonna work out. If you are, if you have the positive spirit, you're gonna, you know, conquer the world. I thought everything's supposed to work out if you do the right thing, the right equation. But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, the gospel, the love of God, is not an equation. It's not a formula. It's not a fix-all problem. You know what that is? When you actually live the life, when you begin to live the narrow road, when you walk through the narrow path, narrow gate, you begin to realize when you try to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. There will be prices that you have to pay as a Christian. For example, if you're really pursuing after the glory of God, the beauty of God, right? You would want to wake up early in the morning so you can come and gaze upon His glory. Don't you? That's the price that you pay. But you know, when nobody really complains about, complains about the price that you have to pay for the you know, expression of love for that person. Do you? For example, like I'm still single, but uh, I, hopefully I'll get married one day. Um, let, let's say I take my future wife-to-be, you know, and I say, you know what, I'm going to pay um, $10 to get your ring. How much does she worth? Ten dollars. 
if I'm willing to sacrifice my entire annual salary to gain her love, to rescue her or to save her somehow, how much does she worth in my life? My annual salary. But if you're willing to risk your entire life to somehow rescue her or maybe to, to save her, how much, does she, how much does she matter in your life? How much does she matter in your life? She matters more than your life. So God listens to the praises that we offer to him. God, I want to praise you. I want to give you all my life. You know, God, please, God, God is pleased with those praises. But I'm going to tell you today, God is willing to see the sacrifices, the sacrifice that you make for him. God tells me, God tells you tonight, what have you sacrificed to, be, to have more of me in your life? What have you laid down in your life so you can have more of me, more of my presence, more of my beauty in your life? When you look at a lot of people, a lot of young people, they complain to God, God, why don't you show me your beauty? Maybe you're not really out there. But my question is, what have you risked in your life to have more of you, more of him in your life? You know, God is not supposed to be lightly treated. When you live for the glory of God, there are consequences that you have to pay. And what is that? If the, the consequences, it's a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice yourself. No glory comes without sacrifice. If you believe so, please say amen. amen. Number three, we're going to just brush through. Number three, then what is the outcome of this outcome of that sacrifice? What is the outcome of the sacrifice? Let's, let's look at verse 25. Let's read this together. Ready? Verse 25. Ready? Go. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for, for eternal life. Amen. Your purpose of your life, the purpose of your life is to live for the glory of God. It is to have him as a matter of your life. You rest your entire life on it. You gaze upon his glory. You pursue after him. You, pro you proclaim his glory. Simple thing to do, but a very difficult thing. Because the moment you decide to do that, you're willing to risk anything to, to, be, to, to be able to accomplish that in your life. But when you do that, there are outcomes of it. There are fruits of your ministry. You know what that is? Life. You will begin to save people's lives as well as your life, your own life. People who want to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose his life for my sake will have eternal life. You know, that's the equation that I think you should, you should abide by. Sacrifice, life. Glory, sacrifice. Sacrifice, glorification. Always it comes in pairs. You know, I actually saw that throughout my life. I never knew what my father did for a living when I was a little kid. My father was in Japan. I was in Korea back then. My, only, my father speaks only in Japanese. I speak only in Korean back then. So my father and I, we would, we would use body language, you know. It's like, my father would say, oh, my ice cream, tabiru. that means, like, you want ice cream? He would say, you, you, my, I, 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 I. this is how I would talk to my father. It's like, you know, that's a communication, you know? Yeah, yeah my, but still, my father um, thinks my brother-in-law is a lion. It's Haja. His, his English name's Ryan. <laughs> lion. Yeah. Hey, don't laugh. I know your parents pronounce Montgomery, Montgomery. Don't laugh. We're all, we, we all have Korean parents and Japanese parents. My father, since we can communicate, um, I, did, I never knew what my father did for a living. The only way that I, you know, I was able to somehow guess what my father was do, doing for, li for a living was to look at his appearance. He's about six foot one, six, six feet one, and uh, he's dark skinned. He's not African American. He's not. He's just. He's just. Very, very tanned Korean. His hair is really, really short. He always wears pinstripe suit. Well-dressed man driving around black Mercedes. What are, you, what are you picturing? A model? No, he wasn't. This actually becomes a problem when you go to um, elementary school. First grade in elementary school, I would go to school. Um, the teacher, you know, made all the students come up to the front, and we, we, we have to introduce our family to everybody, our classmates. And my friends actually, you know, they actually had a very good idea, you know, what their 
fathers actually do for a living. So my friends would go, my father is a police officer, or my father is a firefighter, or my father is a teacher, or my father is a politician, my father is a president, no, you're lying. <laughs> yeah. My turn came. What are you supposed to say when you have no idea what your father does for a living? And he only comes once a month to Korea, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday he goes back. I only saw my father once a month for three days. It's like a three-day retreat with him. So what are you supposed to say? I just told my classmates the description of my father. I said, my father is six foot one. And the teacher actually scolded me. She's like, you don't even know what your father does for a living? Go home and find out. I asked my mom, bad idea, she never told me. When you're in third grade, you have a better idea what, his father, what, you know, what your father does for a living. Because my father would come home, he would take off his suit jacket, and there was a gun, pistol, on his side. And back then in Korea, and there was a TV show, famous TV show called FBI. And I would go to school when I was in third grade, and my teacher actually asked all the students to come up and share. You know, all the students are sharing. Oh, my father is a missionary. My father is a pastor, and whatnot. And my turn came. I was so proud. My father is an FBI. The <laughs> <laughs> teacher still scolded me. She goes, "You're lying." I was like, "No, I'm not." But you know. I actually found, found out what my father actually did for a living when I was in seventh grade. I was in Japan. I was, I was already speaking Japanese, being able to communicate with my father. When I was in Japan, when I was seventh grade, uh, my father actually told me on the way to school. A big shock as a seventh grader on the way to school. My father it was, a Jap was a Japanese mafia, Yakuza. Jap you know Yakuza, right? Japanese mafia. So I'm an, I'm an MK, not a missionary because I'm a mafia kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did you know? I actually, I actually went to the MK seminar as a as a as a speaker a few a few, a few months ago. Uh, I was like, I'm a MK, <laughs> I'm mafia kid. <laughs> but you know, there's different grades of mafia, Japanese yakuza, and not everybody's like low class. There's some different classes of yakuza. The very bottom class is called chimpira. Which, is, which are the guys with like tattoos, and those are the guys that, that are first to get killed in the movie. You know, so wearing this like collared shirt, you, they walk around like this. Like, they have to wear a lot of tattoos because that's the only way they can scare people, you know? It's like, tattoo, <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> that's the only way. That's why I get big into all the tattoos. You know? But there's another class of Yakuza on top of that called um, uh, Tekia, Tekia. They're the ones who actually get money and get, provide protection um, from and for the, uh, the street vendors. And they actually go around the stores and collect money, and they promise protections. And there's another uh, form of Yakuza that's on top of that called Bakuchi. These are the gamblers. Those are the guys wearing the white um, stomach um, band, sitting down like this with these tattoos, and they're um, rolling around the dice. They're like, hey, hey, machas, hey, hey, hey. They do like casino and pachinko and poker and mahjong. And those are the, the gamblers. And there's another yet former Yakuza that's on top of that. It's the highest class Yakuza called uh, Kokudo, which is a traditional one. They don't even have tattoos. They wear suits around. They're business people. And they're, they're involved with politics. My father was a businessman. And the type of um, the, the, the organization, the clan that he was involved in, is actually probably the largest clan in Japan called Yamaguchi Kumi. Yamaguchi clan is actually the largest. It's so big, it actually is divided into different, according to different regions. Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Kobe, Fukuoka, Yokohama, different places. But the, the headquarter, HQ, is Kobe. That's where Oyabun, the boss actually, the godfather lives there. But he's an old man, probably 80 years old. He doesn't really function much. So he placed the number twos, wakagashira, the young pillars of the organization according to different regions. My father was actually in charge of, he was the number two of um, the, he was the, I guess, the person in charge of the Kyoto region. And this is my father. My mother obviously had no idea who he was. She thought he was a businessman. They got married. I'll leave it up to your, uh, I'll leave it up to your imagination of what kind of marriage they had. I'm going to tell you this much. It wasn't, it wasn't a good family. Um, if there was one, 
wish that I had as a child is to get the revenge. Revenge for my mother. I want to somehow knock him out one day. I wanted to leave home. The only reason that kept me, kept me away from doing that is because if I knock him down, if I leave home, my mom's going to be alone. That's the only reason why I didn't do that. But I still remember as a little kid, my mom used to take me to church at night. It was probably uh, 11.50 or something. My mom would dress me up. Like, you know, this Korean boys with like sweat, sweatpants and she would wear two, two, two layers of socks and you, you would tuck in the sweatpants inside the socks. And my mom would take me to church at night, winter day. At 12 a.m., she would unlock the church door and she would come in. She would make me lie down on the front pew and she would wrap me up with a blanket and say, you sleep here. And she would turn to the stove and she would face the pulpit and she'll actually sit right here and she'll kneel down and she'll pray all, all night it wasn't just one or two hours of prayer i pray for my family it wasn't like that 12 a.m until the sunrise service every single night five hours straight and uh, she probably thought i was sleeping but i was lying down like this i was watching my mom praying from behind she had two prayer topics. Number one, Father, would you transform my husband? I want him to encounter the gospel and accept you as his personal Lord and Savior. And not only that, but maybe ordain him as an elder of the church. And Japan, Japanese Christian population, is only 0.2% of the national population. And we want to start a church, we want to plant a church in Japan where the gospel should be preached. And I, I think of, I hope there will be an old days, you know, where, where we get much older. And I want my husband to open up his day with a prayer and reading the, reading the word of God and close his day with prayer. And these are the pictures my mom was drawing in, in, in our mind as she was praying. Second prayer topic, God, I lift up my son and daughter. I give them to you. However you want to use them, use them. You know what? A lot, of, a lot of my relatives actually laughed at her, saying, you know, be realistic. That's not going to happen. But for the, for the sake of time, I'm going to just tell you the conclusion. Uh, probably 30 years passed since then. My father is now an elder. He was ordained as a, as an, as a uh, he, he, was, he was ordained as an elder, and he became a Christian. And uh, he started a church in Japan. And two years ago, he got retired, and now he's in Korea. But every single morning, whether it's 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., I wake up. He always beats me. I always go out to the living room. He's always praying. He opens up his entire day with the word of God, and he closes the entire day with, uh, with prayer. Even at this very moment, he's probably praying for me. Because every time I preach, I text him. I'm starting. Whenever I'm done, I text him. I'm done. Throughout the entire time, he's praying. So what happened to the second prayer? My mother's son is now a pastor and a missionary. Her daughter is doing her PhD in preaching, and she's a pastor in Los Angeles. You know, the, you think this is just a rare story? No, it's not. I'm going to tell you tonight. This is the equation that God has set, the law that God, God has set from the beginning. If one grain of wheat stays without falling, it will remain alone. But if it falls to the ground and if it dies, it will bear much fruit. The reason your family is not changing is because of you. The reason that God has placed you in that family of suffering is for those family members to return to God through you. But are you going to say, oh, I pray for an hour every night and it's not changing? You know what? An hour is, may, may not be enough. It is to transform. It is to decode and re-encode your, your, it's, it's, it's to rearrange, rewire your entire father's childhood, your, his entire life into the man of God. You think it's going to be done with one hour every night? I don't think so. You have to invest your entire life into it so he can be transformed, so he can be rewired, so he can be converted, so he can accept Jesus Christ. If you want your school to change, if you want your friends to change, if you want your brothers and sisters to change, if you want your family to, family to change, if you want your father to come back to your home, maybe this is a time for you to sacrifice yourself. 
Because unless those things happen, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, no fruit's going to be bare. Lastly, number four, how do I do this now? I mean, you're probably troubled. Am I, where am I supposed to start? I'm going to tell you one simple thing. The gospel is always simple for everybody. It's the lowest common denominator. I'm going to tell you, how do I do this? Verse 26, let's read this. Verse 26, read, re, let's read this together. Ready? Go. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Amen. What's the purpose of my life? The glory of God. What price do I have to pay in order to live for the purpose of my life? Sacrifice. What is the outcome of the, uh, of the sacrifice? Life. The life fullness. And how do I do this? You're probably thinking, where do I sacrifice? What, how am I supposed to glorify God? You know, where do I even begin to bear fruit? But I'm going to tell you tonight, it's very simple. Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, be with me. Walk with me. Accompany me. It's the oneness of God. Why? Because if you find him beautiful, you'll want to be with him. You want to be with him wherever he is. And when you're doing that, you will have to make sacrifices. God, because I want to be with you, maybe I can't be with those friends. Because I, because I want to be so close to you, maybe I have to say no to these things. You have to do that. There comes, the sacrifice comes as an outcome of your, uh, of your, uh, of your awe in the presence of God. And when you're doing that, without you realizing, the kingdom of God unleashes itself and makes the kingdom of God around you. The life fullness. And some people will say, you know what? Oh, yes, being one with God is not a bad idea. It's a good life. But I'm going to tell you, if you are willing to say that, you're probably, you don't really understand who God is. I'm going to tell you tonight, Jesus Christ, he has already left the 99 saved sheep. And he's already out there looking for the one last sheep. Where the 99 saved ones are, that's where the spotlights are. Where the one lost sheep is, that's where you get rocks thrown at when you share the gospel. Where the 99 sheep are, that's where you, when you preach, and people, that's, that's where people come to you and say, Oh, Pastor, Pastor Johnny, have a great preaching. Thank you for your sermon. But where the one lost sheep is, when you share the gospel, that's where you get crucified. But Jesus is saying, you know what? I have to leave the 99 sheep because there's still one person missing there. But I'm going to go there. Will you be willing to join me? Because you find me beautiful. Because you find me as the purpose of your life. Would you accompany me? Would you be willing to do that? I said yes. That's why I left the U.S. That's why I'm out there in China. Because one day this is what something that just went through my mind. I'm not saying this to belittle the U.S. ministry work. I'm not saying that at all. But this is what God has spoken to me personally. This is what he said. Daniel, without you, the church will still go on with the worship. Without you here, they'll find another youth pastor. Without you here, people will still hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But without you there, who's going to go? And I said, okay, I'll go. Because I loved him. And next thing I find out, I was standing. And what Jesus says is really interesting. Jesus says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. On that day, I can't wait. On that day, Jesus is going to tell the Father, God, Father, I know him. Because he actually accompanied me. He, he was with me throughout the entire journey. I know him. When I left the U.S., I thought I was leaving the good life behind you know, all the comfortable things, constant paychecks coming in, driving my Jeep Wrangler with extra large wheels. I thought this is the life that I want. But when I left that stuff, I thought I was surrendering something for God. But you know what? I surrendered something really, really small to God. But now, five years later, I'm actually coming back to the U.S. as a preacher. You think you're giving something to God? But you know what? Many years later, God gives something greater back to you, and inside of it, if you, look, if you really look at it, the thing that you have left behind has already become part of the big thing that God returns to you. God will honor you for that. Let us pray.